In this episode, I'm joined by Henry Shukman, award-winning poet, Zen teacher, and author of One Blade of Grass, a Zen memoir. In this interview, Henry discusses his upbringing in Oxford as the son of a don and a graduate of the illustrious Dragon School, and how in poetry he found the liberating aspect of literary life. Henry reveals his first awakening experience, the breakdown that occurred thereafter, and how finding meditation saw him begin a quest to deepen his spiritual life. Henry discusses the importance of finding a teacher, how he overcame a childhood learned distrust of men to do so, and why his Zen practice brought an end to his professional writing career. So without further ado, Henry Shukman. Henry Shukman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Henry, thank you very much for being willing to be interviewed, especially in the midst of your, your recovery uh, from a concussion. Yeah. You know, because of your recovery, we do have a limited time. And so I would encourage people who are listening and anyone who's going to find this conversation interesting, which I think will be most people, to seek out Henry's latest book, One Blade of Grass, which is his biography of his journey uh, as a Zen practitioner. Fascinating read. So I thoroughly recommend that. That being said, perhaps, first of all, Henry, if you could set up a little bit your upbringing and the context in which you were raised. It's the sort of context that I think movies are made of and books are written about. And there's a lot of, I think, uh, uh, I suppose, romance, perhaps, at the idea of the sort of upbringing you had. Perhaps you could talk about that aspect, but also it wasn't without its difficulties. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Steve. And uh, I appreciate very much the kind words on the book, actually, thank you. Um, basically, I, you know, I grew up in Oxford, England. Both my parents were professors. And uh, uh, I, so that was, you know, it's a beautiful ancient medieval city and um, it was a very uh, wonderful place to grow up in many ways. Um, I had a, um, a, a difficult uh, skin condition from the age of six months, which was uh, uh, present right through into my 20s, actually. And it was uh, eczema was the condition. I had it very severely and was from time to time hospitalized and uh, so on. So it was quite a, a difficult thing to grow up with and probably, I imagine, very traumatic, you know, when I was uh, young, I mean, even an infant, I had to be separated from people and stuff like that. And um, so it was, it was uh, difficult in many ways, but I also had this beautiful, yes, uh, uh, sort of situation with, uh, you know, a very um, um, uh, literary kind of milieu that I grew up in. Where books were everywhere, and I was, I found my way to poetry as a young, as a young teen, and um, I also had uh, summers where um, I, I and some friends of mine, we 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 got into kind of roving around the countryside north of Oxford. We'd just, you know, put on a backpack. This is age 13, 14, 15, and spend days on end just sort of wandering the hills and fields and you know sleeping by hedgerows and under under trees and and uh, cooking for ourselves and and you know really living a, a kind of um idyllic maybe a little bit worse worthy and kind of childhood among the hills and fields and that was that was fantastic and in a way we were inspired in that by our love of the uh, Chinese poets, you know, there are these wandering poet monk types from uh, Tang Dynasty China, so going back to 8th, 9th or 7th century in China, figures who would uh, kind of leave home and wander through the mountains and gorges and write poems. And the, the idea of living a life where, you know, you, you just sort of a uh, you you really didn't have a destination in mind. You were free to uh, experience this moment without trying to reach somewhere else. And that that openness to now allowed these poets to um, to you know really experience where they were, and uh, and to the point where their appreciation was acute enough 
that it would want to express itself in a poem. That, that was something that, you know, I and, and particularly a friend of mine, actually, a great poet called Sam Willits, who uh, has one book out, and he and I grew up doing this kind of thing together with some other friends. But that, that feeling of belonging, discovering a sense of belonging in the landscape, you know, and, and somehow a, a, a kind of, you know, sense of beauty would well up and would want to find words. And it was, it was, you know, it was, it was kind of beautiful to, to be able to do that. And I would, I would be um, wrestling at the same time with this eczema thing. Cause it, it didn't, you know, it, it really, I, I was supposed to try to keep it, you know, clean and, and not get it infected all the time it was a kind of a battle. And, and I would, I would, um, when we got out on the land like that, there was always a sense of sort of liberation because I'd like to screw the eczema. I'm just going to, you know, I can't, I can't be restrained by the protocols I'm supposed to follow. I got to do this thing, you know, and, and I, and it would, it would be really beautiful for several days. And I come back and then kind of, kind of have very, very sore parts of my body I had to tend to, but it didn't matter because, you know, we'd had this deep, rich sense of, of um, engaging with life, you know, yeah, so is, is that is that a little sense of it, Steve? Do you think? Uh, yes, of, of I, th that, I think so. I think it is. Yeah, it's wonderful. And you went on to become uh, much later a decorated poet and author. Actually, I would say that's the case. Why do you laugh? <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's, award well, it's, winning, perhaps. Yeah, 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 you know, it's it's true. I suppose it's true. I don't. Um, yes, I got I got very lucky. You know, in in. Um, in certain ways in, 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 my, in, my, in my writing life. I, you know, I did start young and I was very kind of committed to it and, and had various ups and downs, but I got published um, along the way and, and actually was able to um, you know, make a living at it and, um, for quite a few years with, yes, yes, indeed, you're right. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I had some good fortune uh, fall on me in, in the poet, from the poetry world um and uh i i guess you know that things change at a certain point when my priorities shifted um through through practice um and uh but i i you know and i actually sort of stopped i i kind of stopped being a, a professional writer at a certain point you know and became busier teaching meditation um and didn't really expect to uh, be deeply engaged in writing again, but actually this this book, the One Blade of Grass, um, started sort of uh, coming in during you know different different points. It just chunks of it sort of arrived, and I I scribbled them down and didn't really think too much about them. But over the years, and it was several years, I I, I started to realize at a certain point. Well, wow, there's quite a lot of this, and it does seem to kind of fit together. And uh, maybe there's a book here, and so it gradually, against my expectations, and almost to some extent against my will, really, um, it I, I actually did sort of let it form into a book, and 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 uh, and it came out. But yeah, that was sort of uh, not something I'd expected to happen, really. Yeah. And it's that's a very interesting point, and one that I'd like to ask you about a little later, uh, how it was that as you deepened your Zen practice and engagement with Zen, your writing stopped, you stopped writing. And I'd like to ask you a bit about that later. But perhaps at first, uh, another point on your childhood, which I was very curious about reading the book, you write, our academic parents didn't have great wealth, but they had educational resources. So that was what they heaped on us. We were brought up to excel in humanities, sciences, literature, languages, music, something, anything, so long as we excelled. And in Oxford, you went to the Dragon School, an illustrious school founded in 1877 by a group of Oxford Dons. And it has quite an impressive alumni, as these sorts of schools often do. I'm wondering if you could explain a bit about the school, its ethos and so on, and what it was like 
for you to study there. And also, in a certain sense, if you feel that that aspect of your childhood equipped you or influenced your worldview, um, perhaps equipped your intellectual or personal capacities in some way that became relevant as you deepened into your Zen practice. Yes, yes. Thank you for asking that. Um, when I was at that school, it, it was a remarkable school. I, I, I think I know it's still going strong, but I think it's changed in some ways. It, it, back then, a lot of the kids were the children of, of dons at Oxford. Um, there was a certain number who were, you know, boarding. There was a bit of a division, really, between the day kids who were children of Oxford professors and the boarding kids who came from elsewhere and tended to be kind of, you know, more, um, well, from a slightly different world, they were tended to be more aristocratic or, you know, country, country squires kids kind of thing. And the worlds were a little bit separate of these two categories. But what was, what was great there, I think one thing anyway that stands out was just the, the fact that, um, you know, like my friend Sam and I, we were both really encouraged in our writing in, uh, and, and kind of fed really good things, for example, to read. There, was, there were two or three you know, English teachers who kind of noticed that we were really into this stuff and, and really helped us and just strategically try this book, boys. And, you know, and it was very enriching and fertilizing for our, our creative um, impulses and 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 you know that that kind of encouragement and nurturing, um, I think, was a great gift, and it it gave, um, well, me and 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 Sam and many others, I think, too, you know, sort of a confidence or a trust or something that somehow it was worth trying to pursue um, the livelihoods and and the vocations. That we felt called to, and mm. I th I think that was a a precious thing. On the other hand, there is a phenomenon that I came to see. You know, both both. I mean, not only in that school, but other schools in Oxford, have a lot of pressure. You know, and I see that. You know, today when I look at um, kids of friends of mine who still live in the city, you know, that um, it's kind of a hot house. It really is for kids. There's there was, uh, to this day, there's still somehow, I see a lot of pressure put on kids to do well. It's like the, you know, the parents generally, you know, uh, again, this is from the world of academia, you know, that on the whole, they're, you know, they're, they're, um, they're not like wealthy, wealthy people, but they've got, you know, middle-class people with a lot of, as I said, sort of educational resources, and somehow, I don't know, the, the, the Oxfords are kind of a crucible in some ways. It's a bit of a pressure cooker because it's so all about education. And so if you're a kid there, you pick up this vibe of sort of education, so important, there's almost nothing else and, and you gotta do well at it and you can do, because here you are, this is where you're living. And I don't know, it's, it's, I mean, it's great, but it is also a lot of pressure and, um, uh, so, you know, there's, that could mean a certain, uh, narrowing of, of, well, it could, could be certain restrictions on certain kinds of growth that a person might also need to do. I think it's pretty, um, intellect based, you know, you know what I mean? In, in Oxford, the, mm. the, the emphasis of us, us kids growing up there, it was, it was, it was mostly intellectual. We were really lucky. We would be poet types, you know, that we just somehow got a little bit of encouragement to grow in a broader way as well. And enough that we realized, I mean, like, for example, just the fact that we knew about those Chinese poets. I mean, that was help from a teacher who said, hey, check out these poets. And we, you know, we got into certain early 20th century London poets 
who had been reading and translating those Chinese poets. Mm. So, you know, and that, that kind of broadened this sense of what it was to be human that wasn't really just about intellect, and it might have otherwise seemed that. You've described poetry as the liberating aspect of the literary life. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think there was, I mean, again, like growing up with all these people who were academics and who wrote books and stuff, to be a poet seemed like the wildest end of that spectrum. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a straight track to becoming an academic. You know, it was, it was uh, more of a way of engaging with life. You know, it had a, there was this sense that poetry could be an adventure into life. That was something that I remember feeling keenly that poetry could actually somehow create a more intimate um, contact with life with the moment at hand if you just it would it would turn on this sort of appreciative um, capacity it this this the search for beauty knowing that there's beauty to be found because because you know that's what poetry primes us for it primes us for beauty you know so knowing that there's beauty to be found it reorients how how one lives if you if you know that and if you're if you're you know you're, if you're on the hunt for beauty and then when you find it you want to appreciate it and you want to you want to somehow express your appreciation of it it's a way of um loving the world and, 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 you know, like writing a love letter to the world, you know, I mean, uh, uh, maybe it sounds like I'm kind of surely oversimplifying what a poem can be, but on some level it includes that, you know, they say poets mourn and celebrate in equal measure, you know. Um, yeah. I'm curious to what extent you think that an education in, shall we say, the canon of great poetry is useful or helpful in understanding or accessing that dimension of poetry. And what I mean by that is that poetry, if, you, if I think of someone like T.S. Eliot, for example, whose work is soaked with references, uh, references across many cultures certainly drawn from the western canon of you know civilization and religion and references and so on uh, mm -hmm. but really to understand the density and all the inflections and shades of the genius of somebody like t.s Eliot, for example requires uh it, it's a study in, in a certain mm -hmm. sense itself not to say that one can't be struck by something knowing nothing as well mm -hmm. but i'm curious uh, poetry, I think, in, in that way, a little bit like Zen, perhaps, or a little bit like jazz, or maybe a little bit like Bach, seems to benefit from uh, some sort of scaffolding, some sort of mm -hmm. systematic introduction. E even the uh, nuance of meter and, uh, and metaphor, for example. So I'm curious uh, if you if have any reflections on that idea, this, the way in which poetry can be accessed that way, but also somehow by feeling without necessarily catching any of the references. And also I'm curious who who your poetic influences at the time were uh, beyond the Tang Dynasty poets, <laughs> who, who struck you in particular? Yeah, 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 no, thanks for that. I mean, you know, I have to be honest and frank here. So I, I was never really taken with T.S. Eliot. He was too erudite and too full of those illusions and references. For me, I, I liked plainer poets. You know, I was, there were contemporary poets at the time, like, you know, Seamus Heaney, Ted Hughes, mm. um, and, um, and, um, 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 Sharon Olds, I loved actually, and um, and so on. I mean, many contemporary poets, I guess, or a handful. But then I really loved Robert Frost and um, 
and uh, Thomas Hardy. I was Hardy's been one of my favorite poets all along, you know, and he he just uh, he just sort of speaks from the life around him. You know, you never you never really need to know anything to read a Hardy poem. I, I mean, you don't need to. You, you don't need to have read anything else to get Hardy. And that's kind of the same with Frost. And, and I, I loved um, Emily Dickinson as well. Mm. And, and Wordsworth, you know, and these poets, you know, they're, they're not, um, they weren't like Eliot spinning a web of literary references. You know, they were, they were, I mean, of course, not all Eliot does that. I love some of his, I did love and do love some of his poems, but they tend to be the, the simpler ones, you know, and um, I'm just trying to remember the name. Like he's got, a, there's two called the Preludes. They're, they're just beautiful. They're kind of evocations of scenes in London. You know, and I love that kind of thing. Mm. And, um, but so I really was a, a little bit against the grain um, as a poet and as an appreciator of poetry myself in that I didn't really get the kind of highbrow you know, what they called it high modernist poetry of T.S. Eliot. Um, and Ezra Pound to some extent as well, although I kind of liked Pound when he was doing riffs on the Chinese poets, actually. He, he loved those poets as well. But he was very difficult, you know, and actually I don't really think poetry needs to be so difficult. I think great poetry can be kind of simple and yet has lots of depths, different levels of depths to it. And you kind of feel that even as you're understanding it on a first read, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm, 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 my poetry has always been relatively sort of straightforward. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not hard to understand. Um, so, and I, I do think in a way, I almost used to feel that poetry kind of took a wrong turning when it became so difficult in the 20th century and that you know and that and and some people sort of uh you know some scholars and poets feel that there was an alternate stream of poetry running through the 20th century that was much clearer and easier to understand and 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 you know that would have been represented represented by people like yeah hardy frost probably Philip Larkin and, you know, and various others. Um, and I suppose I appreciated that more easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you. Jumping ahead a little bit. The years leaving beyond Oxford were quite uh, tumultuous in a certain sense, in and out of uh, the country, as you say, living somewhat of an itinerant life at times in and out of Cambridge University. At 19 years old, you had what you've called a revelatory experience on a beach, uh, which you described also as intimate with the whole universe, a strange and marvelous moment of liberation. You write in One Blade of Grass, it was like an explosion of beauty, bliss, joy, but it was much more. I had seen into some kind of invisible truth hidden in the heart of all existence. As I walked back down the shore afterwards, I felt as though I weighed nothing. I drifted, I floated, the world floated too. Palm trees, cactuses, the lapping waves of the heavy, slow Pacific, the muscular surface of the sea, the light in the western sky, which was turning luminous orange, and the moon hanging in it like a chip of chalk. It was as if we were all in one and the same movie, or dream, which no one could ever intrude on. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience and sketch uh, how that eventually, via circuitous route, led you to Zen? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so having had no knowledge or real interest in spirituality, um, when I was 19, I was, I was working abroad and, and then backpacking in South America, actually. And and towards the end of the trip, I had this, I wrote my first book on that trip, actually. And 
uh, at a certain point, I was, yeah, I was on a beach and on my, all, on, all alone, actually, nobody else around. And late afternoon and looking at the sun lowering in the sky and looking at the, the sunlight on the water. And suddenly, you know, I, 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 I had an experience that, I, I, you know, I had no idea what it what it was at the time but it was uh, uh, but in retrospect it it clearly was some kind of you know sudden awakening but i didn't i didn't have any language like that back then all that i knew was that i suddenly was no longer an observer separate from what i was looking at somehow i and what i was seeing were one and the same we were it, it's it, it it was it was as if I'd been sort of sucked into the world and become part of it, and it was overwhelmingly beautiful and and it was like a, a just a kind of great tidal wave of love, swamping everything and and sort of in the midst of it, somehow I I could sort of I got this sense that everything was 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 had no there was no space there was no distance everything was immediately close and at the same time everything was kind of made of nothing it was all um, a kind of open clarity and it, it was you know it was it was just utterly overwhelming and it kind of um i suppose sort of you know faded a little bit you know and i kind of kind of some part of me sort of came back it was sort of could at least register what what what, what is this and it was, and at that point i remember just being overwhelmed with this sense of of love it was like uh, just um discovering that everything was universally loved or something it was just 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 incredible and beauty and relief and 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 belonging it was this feeling of of being part of everything had such a such a powerful flavor of belonging and um and 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 i i felt that i my life was fulfilled and it was as if i'd fulfilled the purpose of my life without ever having known that it had a purpose it was kind of what it felt like and and certainly not yet having been in search of a purpose it, it was as if it all came at once and and i could have died after it quite quite happily um and that kind of um you know of course it the, the intensity of it the vivid intensity of it sort of faded over the days and um but a a, a buoyancy a lightness a emptiness of self and of, of somehow everything being a bit transparent that that kind of lingered for weeks um and but then i went home and when i got home i had a really hard time i i i had uh actually um i came home and almost immediately was was uh um was knocked over by a kind of some kind of breakdown and just tumbled into despair and that was that was a combination of things you know i think one thing was that i'd never actually understood that you know elements of my childhood have been quite traumatic the skin thing i talked about already but also there's a very difficult divorce that my parents went through and very it was very difficult for several years and and um and that was when i was you know a young kid and the the unhappy side of my childhood that i'd somehow managed to freeze out or keep at bay or something when i got home in this state of of great openness you know and just very sort of tender and open and full of love i i had no defenses against the things that i had held off as a kid and they just sort of swamped me and i was really uh very very uh unhappy and and um very contracted i mean v looking back on it through the lens of trauma i've done quite a bit of somatic trauma work over the years and 
you know, I, I feel I was, I was sort of re-traumatized on re-entry to home. And, but I didn't have, again, language like that then. I just felt that I'd made a terrible mistake in coming home and, um, and lived with this sort of grating sense of having made a terrible error for, for several years and kind of managed to get through college and actually began a, a postgraduate, uh, well, a PhD, um, uh, that didn't I didn't finish it but I got started on it but but always with this sort of sense that you know half of me was absent and and lost and that I was never going to get it back a real despair it was a kind of lingering backdrop to life and you know that that was um that's that started to shift when a friend encouraged me to start meditating and somehow I just decided to take it seriously. I think I was 24 at the time. And, um, and it was TM, which was uh, uh, the most, uh, probably the, 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 the best known form of meditation back then. This was the, I guess the late eighties in London. Mm. And I started doing TM religiously, 20 minutes twice a day. And it was, it was really uh, very salutary. And I started to unwind a little bit, my, my ragged, um, by the way, I didn't mention this, but almost as soon as I got home back when I was 19, my eczema came back, you know, it had been, there'd been a reprieve while I was away on that gap year. And then it came back. And anyway, so once I was doing the meditation a few years on, my nervous system just started to unwind a little bit and a little more space, a little more fluidity, tasting ease a bit more. I started to sort of, I'd been so wound up and, and, and so sort of caught in negative cycles of thinking and stuff. And just to have a little bit of space in each day um, made a huge difference. And actually, you know, at a certain point, I kind of uh, was then encouraged by another friend to start, you know, come, come into a therapy group that she was part of. And, and I began, a, you know, quite a long healing journey. And, um, and it's been really the sort of theme of, of much of my life was kind of um, how does, if you have an opening like that experience, if you have a a, a strong awakening of some kind, you know, how do you live it? And it was in the context of that search that I stumbled across Zen um, and realized somehow that Zen knew the answer to that question, that Zen was concerned with that question. And um, I believe that was a correct assessment that I think Zen is, is it knows about awakening and it is concerned with how to live it, that it's not enough just to awaken. Uh, I mean, maybe for many it is, but for some of us it isn't. And actually Zen also knew that, yes, I may have had a, an, an experience like that randomly, but there was more, more to discover, more to experience, that there are other experiences, there are other sort of, faces of awakening not just one you know and and um that there's a path here it's 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 it was a sense that sort of it wasn't simply yeah wow you've had this great experience and really i, I really felt that sort of really fucked up i'd kind of lost it and done whatever i should have done but i hadn't done but that was the wrong way of thinking it was more like a door opened and actually yeah maybe i didn't go through it in some sense but you can go through it and that's not the end. The path goes on and there's more thresholds and more discoveries. And it was, it was, it was wonderful to find a path of a kind of training that really sort of understood this dimension of growth for a human being, namely in awakening and its integration into life. And so that became 
uh, my my primary path of practice while also you know carrying on with my sort of worldly life and career mm. and relationships you know you described yourself as a skeptical rebellious guy who didn't like teachers in your book you write now that i'd finally concluded i needed a teacher i'd underestimated what was involved in finding one i was my own man authority free i didn't like teachers they scared me they were like my dad when i was a teenager they found me lacking, distasteful. They made me feel ashamed. My response had been to do without them. And later in the book, you write, I was a lone wolf, snarling with distrust. Can you talk a little bit about that process that you've described there, those uh, reactions to teachers, they found me lacking, distasteful even, that's a very interesting uh, choice of words. And why it was that you decided you needed a teacher and how it was that you found one and what difference or impact that made in terms of your own path. Yes, thank you. Thank you for quoting that. It's, 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 it's lovely hearing you read these passages, actually, because they, they strike me in a new way when I hear them read by you. I think you read them very well. And I, I sort of hear things in them I hadn't kind of noticed somehow. You, you bring them to life. Thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, I, I was, yes, I was, I was, uh, I didn't, I just didn't trust. I mean, really almost, I could say, I just didn't trust men, you know, and, and, and I didn't really, in a way, I didn't really know that, you know, I, and obviously, I mean, you know, it kind of psychologically it, it came from my dad having, having in some ways abandoned me when I was seven years old and, and um, and I never had really sort of felt that wound, let alone healed it until later. And so probably I was projecting every time I met, I mean, for example, there was a Zen monastery I used to go to for retreats quite regularly. And the kind of, the next step would have would have been to sign on and become a student of the, the guy who ran it. And I was often feeling like I was on the brink of doing that. And there'd be a kind of sense of it being quite a positive thing to do. And something would make me recoil from doing it. It was just a, a distrust that, you know, I, I don't know, can I, can I really put my my growth, my development, my, you know, and uh, not even exactly knowing what my development and growth might be, but whatever they might be, can I really put them in the hands of, of somebody else, uh, especially a rather authoritarian man um, who ruled the, the monastery with a, with a kind of an iron fist, you know, and it, it just didn't feel, you know, sometimes it would feel like a positive thing. And then it just, it just didn't, it, it would just feel, ah, I can't do this. And, and I did anyway, I didn't. And, but this, with, this went on with that place and various other places I visited and always trying to see, can I, can I join this place? Or, um, I mean, I guess there was a sense that, um, that's what you did, you know, the, when, whenever I went to uh, retreat centers, you know, that there'd, there'd be, there'd be people there who, you know, they, they, in some way they'd signed on, they were either coming repeatedly for training there, or they were living there. And it seemed that this is what you needed to do. And, um, and yeah, it, 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 I, I was, I, I kind of wanted to, but I didn't want to. I think there was a, there was also a sense of, you know, I wasn't really very, um, I suppose, trusting of, of groups. You know, I didn't really want to join a group. I, I, I kind of liked, um, I, I liked being, you know, sort of uh, my own, my own person, you know, and, and um, what happened, I, I can, just jumped to the conclusion really was that at a certain point I just I just met a teacher in a center who 
it just felt like there was no issue. He happened to be a, a very wise, kind, gentle teacher. I mean, he was a, he was a wise, kind, gentle guy. A uh, very remarkable man, I think. He, was, uh, he ran two charities for severely disabled people. And he, um, he had retired quite young from being a lawyer and he had a you know wife and grown up kids and um so he was he was sort of a you know recognizably sort of normal kind of guy not not a monastic you know um a lay a lay guy but very very deep very deep in his practice and you know he was really he was zen and gentle and he was living deep Zen awakening in an ordinary life. And that, that was what I wanted. You know, I think this was another issue, I guess, that I hadn't actually seen a model of what, what I was looking for until then. I'd seen models, examples that were probably wonderful and deep and clear and everything, but they weren't quite what, what I had been looking for although i i didn't know enough about what i was looking for even to be able to articulate that at the time but when i met this guy john um it was um there just sort of wasn't an issue about it he you know for one thing it wasn't a residential center he wasn't he was showing up there every two weeks to to meet with students and give a talk and sit. Uh, so there wasn't really a, an arena in which he could exercise a big power trip. You know, it, it was, he was coaching people if they wanted to be so coached. And um, that just seemed like healthy to me. And like, there wasn't really, um, there wasn't a great issue about, you know, is he to be trusted? Well, it, it sort of didn't matter. I could trust him to whatever extent I did at that time. And because he wasn't asking for very much, he wasn't asking for anything. It was simply, I show up here every two weeks. If you want to meet with me, you can, and I'll offer some training. And he also uh, was interested that I'd had, by that point, I'd already had sort of two rather striking experiences, that first one and then another one. And and he was interested in that. And he, he sort of knew what to do next. And so it was kind of, it was lovely. It was, I felt so fortunate um, to, to be, I mean, I, I really think uh, it's true when the student's ready, the teacher appears. I think that was, that was true for me. That some sense, I hadn't quite been ready before or the right teacher hadn't appeared. It doesn't really matter, you know. Yeah, is, Steve, have I said enough on that, do you think? Is that? Yes, it's very interesting. I have a couple of follow-up questions. And actually, you, you mentioned there a second uh, profound spiritual experience. And as I said before, you detail several of them in the book. And perhaps in our follow-up discussion, if we, if we do another episode, which I'd very much like to do, then we could go through those and also discuss the different levels of awakening different levels of enlightenment, I suppose, to, to speak very colloquially, uh, that uh, you, you discuss in your work and in your teaching. I'm curious, other than the journey of being able to open up to a teacher-student relationship of, of some type like that, what was, in terms of your own path or trajectory, the benefit or the effect, if you want, of working with a teacher? having been a lone wolf and then entering into that first relationship and i know you had subsequent relationships with teachers to other lone wolves out there what can you say having made that journey and existed within those structures that previously you uh, recoiled from what can you say about uh, what it's like from the inside <laughs> yes yes i mean i i, I want to say first first off that um you know everybody must find their own path, you know? And so I, I don't think there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a thing that fits everybody fine. And, and especially today when there's so many options, you know, 
it's really wise to find what's congenial for your temperament, what suits you. Now, having said that, you, there's a value in, you know, you know, they, what they say, don't, don't dig 10 holes, you know, you'll mm. never get the well, you've got to dig one hole, but you may have to dig 12 holes to find the one that you really want to dig. But when you do dig it, because it's true that that seems to be, I mean, this is again, just, this is just Henry's experience. It does seem that, cause I was fairly eclectic prior actually i haven't really mentioned that but i i did sample lots of different things before uh meeting this particular teacher and the lineage that he was part of um and i still now actually still do kind of a, a variety of ancillary practices you know um but anyway there is there seems to be the possibility of sort of really going through through a somehow you know we, we 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 to go through the transformation or the you know the the real mm, pivot in a life that these deep practices offer us to go th over this fulcrum where you know we may have i mean for example like i mentioned i had okay so i had a couple of quite you know, for, for me, you know, sort of seeming really strong, life-changing, awakening experiences. But something hadn't quite changed. You know, they were experiences that ruptured the fabric of a life that kind of continued. So there was sort of new information in a life. But the way that life was hadn't been through a fundamental shift, you know, in a way. It had had this rupture in it too by then you know that were very sort of striking and of course sort of made a difference but in some way the life hadn't been turned inside out i was still kind of living from the old model in spite of these discoveries and then so what happened when i got into training um well in my case it was a koan training and koans for me were were a really brilliant um path of growth because they they speak from their expressions of um well broadly loosely put the world of awakening they express it but they express it in concrete form here and now and you sit with them until they kind of suck you in and your experience shifts and successively working with them um, can bring about new awakening experiences that where we discover other dimensions of awakened nature that we may not yet have seen. And along the way, I mean, th these happen, but I also feel what they can bring us to this path of training successively with cars, it can bring us to a different kind of experience that's um, that's really uh, uh, well. I would say deeper. It's it reaches deeper. It's it's funny thing to say when any awakening experience seems total and ultimate and complete, and in a sense it is those things always. And yet there can be more, and there can there can be at some point. I think there can be you know, a more thorough experience. It cleans, it just empties out everything. And then it's different after. It really is a turning point. We, and and um, I didn't know that, I didn't really know about that. At some, at some point I started to pick up that there may be something like that that's possible, but I never dreamt that I would ever uh, it undergo it. It just seemed like I was too kind of troubled a person. And I, I didn't really, it, I didn't really, I didn't really think about it very much. I just assumed that's for others. Um, but s at some point in my work with John and with my other teacher, Joan, actually both in one lineage, but um, it, it's something really sort of decisive 
happened, decisive in the sense that it really made a lasting difference. And um, that's what I didn't know was possible because uh, I just thought, you know, these, these so-called Kensho experiences, seeing awakened nature that I'd had, uh, they, they somehow hadn't quite achieved that. But the thing is, it wasn't just the experience. It was also working with people who'd been through that. It, and it wasn't even that they talked about it. It was just encountering them, being in their presence, you know, over years and working with them as their student, doing what they said, you know, sit with this Cohen, come and see where you get with it. Come and come and show me, you know, you have to show the Cohen in a way with the teacher doing that somehow over the years it 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 was it was you know it was helping in all kinds of tangible ways but in some way also in the unseen way it was preparing the ground i think for some other possible shift and um and that was a resolution when that happened it it resolved life um it, it was it was really different from the other moments of awakening you know and mm. and um yeah so so there there that, that was just speaking a little bit to what was it like working with the teachers you know that's fascinating thank you my final question as i know we're now uh, very near the end of our time my final question that i just had to ask really you mentioned that you stopped writing for quite a while when you got deeper into Zen. And I'm wondering, was there something about your creative process that Zen disrupted? And was it worth it to lose that avenue for a period of time? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, yeah, I guess um, it knocked out some um, some core of angst that had always been somehow wrapped up in the energy of my creative process. That that when that was gone. Um, I was there was just this sort of pervasive peace and and desire to help and serve in whatever way was appropriate that didn't need writing or it didn't it didn't need to express itself through writing and so um it was actually very liberating for me to be freed of that for a while and um and uh when when i i only and so when i now i'm writing again <laughs> these days it came back you know but it's different now from different it's really very different sort of motivation than it had been you know it's it's more um i mean it's it's also not professional anymore like i don't i'm, I'm not living off writing you know so there's uh there's there isn't that pressure that I'd had for many years as a young professional writer, you know. Um, and so what is it like now? It's 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 so yes, it was worth it was ever was absolutely worth giving it up. I, I wouldn't have if it had never come back, I wouldn't have minded. It was it was um because there's something you know, it, it, it was it was like it had been so important to me writing, and then all of a sudden wow there's something much more important there's something um that is uh, more immediately important which is you know how how to how to help you know how to be with others and 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 do what i can to help and support and so on and um that was yeah it was it was very freeing to to um to not be carrying this um 
sort of somewhat something of a compulsion, you know, was was in my had been in my way of writing, something a bit compulsive. And um, and maybe also what what I had been wanting to express through writing was now being expressed in every moment anyway, just by living. There was this sense of an amplitude of expression, the universe kind of thing expressing itself so fully in just walking across a room how could any more expression be needed? You know, this very moment is a, just a total expression. It's like the, you know, the ultimate sort of art or artist is this moment being itself. And to, to be able to sense that and appreciate that, I mean, how, how could anything else be needed? Yeah. It would be narrowing to think that some other form of expression is needed. It would be a failure on my part to see how rich, uh, just how complete and thorough, total, this moment is an expression. Does that, does that, am I, am I conveying that? Is that sort of making sense? You are. Yeah. It is. Well, Henry, thank you so much for this conversation. I would love to follow up with a, another interview in the future, talking about, as I said, the unfolding in more detail of the uh, levels, if you want, or stages of awakening that you do teach about, the different types maybe, and also the uh, interaction of trauma and resolving trauma and also the work you've done, very interesting, in terms of dream work, seven years of very intense dream work, etc., and the work in terms of the somatic components. I think these, on the foundation that we've laid today, were very interesting to have a discussion about how those have interacted in your path and how you see those um, working together or adjacently. So, Henry Shukman, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be with you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.